Support the Amigos podcast and keep the Amiga goodness flowing for just a dollar a month. Visit our page at patreon.com slash Amigos podcast. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Amigos, the podcast about everything Amiga. Amigos is a proud member of the Throwback Network, your home for quality retro podcasts. And now, here are your hosts, Aaron Dowdy and John Bodovkar Schaller. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today we're going to be talking about Banshee. And I'm not talking about Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, this is uh, a one. There's one big announcement uh, we passed over the past week or so. 100 posts on the blog. <laughs> that is pretty big. It's I want to. I want to thank Dreamcatcher for posting 97 of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the man is a machine. If you if you haven't been checking out our blog lately and you want to read some great reviews. Uh, he just posted one up on Body Blows. Have you had a chance to read that one yet? I did, and it was great. And I commented at the bottom. I, he, he, um, I've liked everything he's done. <laughs> and this was good. And they're always funny, too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thumbs up to him. It's awesome that we hit the uh, century mark after how many months. But we've, <laughs> we, To be fair, we, we didn't start off with paying much mind to this stuff. But uh, uh, we've picked up steam on it, and Dreamcatch has come on board. we got a lot more action on there. So it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Come over and join us. Uh, on we on our blog, we're also on Facebook, and we have just started up on Google Plus for the six or seven people in there. So <laughs> come and join the other fifteen of us, and we that's all, that's another avenue. It's and always Twitter. a party. I forgot about Twitter. <laughs> Amigospodcast.com. Yeah, we're everywhere. Um, so uh, we got some feedback last week. Oh, all uh, right, let's hear it. So uh, Will Williams writes, friend of the show. He says, uh, "Thanks for the great shows. I really look forward to hearing them." He said, "You mentioned Blitz Basic on the Skid Marks episode." I recall the original release of that game in Blitz in the UK when I was a lad. And he said that there was a huge push uh, in, the Amiga, in the Amiga community uh, to get Blitz Basic to home users to write stuff with it. Yeah. And uh, they actually gave it away on their co- on the cover disc of Amiga format. That's awesome. That, I, that's uh, Who knew? Yeah. And I, I remember when Amiga Blitz, or uh, when that Blitz Basic came out, and, and it was, I mean, I did read a lot about it. I used to pick up the Euromags, too. And uh, I thought that's, that Skid Marks was made. Oh, boy, what a, that right there, if you can make that with it, I mean, you know, you can do a lot of cool stuff with it. Right. And I remember it was pretty popular, as I recall. Yeah, uh, and then he also said that uh, they gave away, uh, speaking of our, our little segment last week on Imagine, they actually gave away Imagine on the front of an Amiga format, too. So I guess, you know... These uh, these subscriptions really paid out, you know. If yeah. You, if you were looking for software, the European magazines were just they were great. They were yeah. great. Even the early issues of Retro Gamer, the first couple of years, they had cover discs. Really, that's something that they've ceased doing. But uh, but yeah, yeah it was it's pretty cool. Uh, that's called they cost six hundred bucks a piece. We did it now, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, the uh, anyway, Will sent us some pictures when we put them up on the blog of both those issues hanging up on his wall. Um. Another listener, this is a guy, he's a first-time writer in her, uh, Darwin Meredith. Writer in her? That's, that's, that's English. It's the, it's what? the Queen's English. I don't know, Queen what? Uh, <laughs> he said, I really enjoy your podcast. Uh, he said, I, I, um, he's listened to all of them, which we, we appreciate. Thank you. Uh, and he's from, uh, he said that, uh, he mentioned that we were from West Virginia and he lives in Wilmington, Delaware. So he's not too far away from us, from the Eastern Panhandle at least, but he said that he visits West Virginia frequently. He enjoys it because it's so easygoing, laid back, and at a slower pace than the East Coast where he lives. And he said, your podcasts are laid back and down to earth. They have analysis of Amiga games, which he really enjoys. So I'm just reading this to stroke our Amiga, basically. Yeah, I, 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 I'm slow moving. There's no doubt about that. I'm just shocked that someone from America wrote this. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, yeah, come on down. Uh, if next time you come down from Delaware, come on down. We'll set you right down here beside the desk. Yeah. Get you get you in. Guest, guest host. Um, and then finally, um, Jonas Rullo writes in about ray tracing on the Amiga. Uh, he said that he had a 500 in Imagine before he transferred to 486. And uh, he said that um, he had scenes that took more than a day to render. Oh, yeah. And he said, I remember putting a scene together in the afternoon, going to sleep, and then going to school the next day, and it still wasn't finished when he got home. 
And so uh, those were definitely, uh, you had to be a patient person. Well, I mean, you know, ray tracing is a funny thing. I knew just enough of how to use the programs to be dangerous. And so I would just type some stuff in and just let it run. And I couldn't sit there and wait for it because I didn't have the patience. Mm -hmm. So I, I could only do it if I was going out of town for the day or for the weekend. I'd come back. And inevitably, I'd come back, I'd see what I rendered, it looked like crap, and I'd delete it. I'd be like, well, I just wasted that time. So people with more talent than me were after this stuff. And finally, uh, Bobby Moore uh, wrote into uh, the Amigos podcast Facebook page, and he said that, uh, he said that uh, there is a new CD32 release. Uh, this is another one of those kind of gray area uh, releases where it contains... Uh, a bunch of or it's seven formula one games so this is uh nigel mansell's world championship f17 challenge formula one super monaco gp uh two games called f1 and grand prix circuit so uh if you're an f1 fan and i know in europe that's definitely a big deal uh you should check out that cd32 release you know there's actually along those lines uh, again uh a legally gray area they uh i noticed that they've put a, uh, a Wonder Dog Amiga port that was enhanced for the CD32 out. I've not played Wonder Dog. You ever played Wonder Dog? No, I've never even heard of it. Uh, it's a uh, it's a it's something that they had at the release on the uh, the Sega CD as really? well. Yeah, and I still haven't heard it's of it. It's not related to Wonder Boy, is it? No, it's a dog. Well, Unless I thought Wonder it Boy's dog? I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. That's more of a, isn't Wonder Boy more of a Master System thing, or did he come yeah, out of Genesis? Yeah, more of a Master System yeah. thing. Uh, but uh, anyway, another one of these uh, sort of, you know, like I said, legally gray. But uh, we'll, we'll link it up. Again, I haven't tried it. I need to try some of these compilation discs since I've got a CD32 sitting around. Mm -hmm. I just haven't, you know, most of them I've just got. It's different when you've got the the, the card, you got the Amiga, you don't have to fire up. The, the, the CD32 is so valuable that I'm afraid you can hardly use it. So I just kind of. Keep it off to the side. But anyway, if you're in a Wonder Dog, uh, we'll link that up. I noticed that uh, the uh, the new beta for WinUAE is out. Uh, I've actually fiddled with it. I don't know what's different, really, but it's out. Uh, if that's your cup of tea. Uh, so there's that. Um, we've got a few other things. that we're, we're linking a lot of articles. I'm pretty much linking any articles I've come across on the uh, Facebook page and boat is as well and also on the Google Plus so uh, you know check check often I usually come across something about it every day it's usually just like articles about history of Amiga and whatnot uh, but uh, you know there's still people writing a lot of stuff out there it's, it's actually quite amazing yeah speaking of which uh, I'm sure most of you uh, are familiar with the kind of landmark Amiga history series uh, on Ars Technica they started this way back in 2007 in fact one of my very first communications with Aaron ever was sending him uh, a message on some forum about uh, you know reading the, the history of the Amiga. And that was probably 2009. Mm -hmm. I think that's when we first started hanging out. And uh, so they have a new one that is all about the video toaster. And just like all the other uh, articles in the series, it's lengthy and entertaining. Uh, it's amazing. One of my favorite uh, artists, Todd Rundgren, uh, he had a he produced a whole video just using nothing but uh, video toaster. What what you mean, Todd Rundgren? Or Hello, it's me, Todd That's right. Rundgren. That's right. And, and this the, was many years after that. And uh, really, yeah. Do, do you remember what it was called? Uh, it's something like the real me or something. But that's a different. That's a different Todd song. Um, I can't this think a, what it's called. This is one of his music a, videos. Yeah, this is an eighty. I mean, obviously, uh, either late eighties or early. 90s, I guess early nineties. That's when the video toaster came out. Uh, yeah, he produced this video, and it's basically a bunch of very cheesy to our eyes, you know, transitions and computer graphics effects. But it was really stunning. I'm sure at the time that he did it all himself. You well, know. that the Amiga video toaster, of course, as I, I've owned one of these for a cup of coffee, but I never really used it because I didn't know how. But it, they managed to do a lot of awesome stuff with it. The, the things that always pop into my mind is the first season of Babylon 5, which I love Babylon 5. It, it was, they used Amiga for the special effects of Video Toaster. And they were good. They were really good. Another show called um, um, Sequest. Sequest DSV. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Cheesy little gym. I, I, believe, watched, I watched every episode I of believe, that. I believe, oh, boat. <laughs> Man, you're talking about Babylon 5, the worst sci-fi series ever. Are you? I'll come across this table, <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just I'll kill buttons. you. The, the, uh, uh, 
The uh, but a C quest was I think that I don't know did that run for more than a season? It ran for like six. It was you've, on forever. You're kidding? Yeah, me. through I know through my entire middle school existence it was on. That is baffling. Well, it, apparently the Amiga toaster was used for that. A uh, few other things, but so I mean it, it wasn't just like uh, something that people tooled around on at the local cable company, although they were used for that too. Mm-hmm. You know, they're but, still uh, they still I remember I still see stories pop up on Reddit of people finally decommissioning you know cable stations decommissioning their video toasters. Oh, and when the toaster came out, I thought, wow, you could have your own TV station. Now, of course, I don't know what that means, <laughs> but I could just picture myself having my own station dancing around on what I would have done for programs, sort of like this, right? <laughs> But uh, wow, just the, just the th- concept of it was so, so far ahead of everything else, you know, you know. And the video toaster was out, you know, late in the game. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> it really probably added a lot of sold Amigas to the uh, to the kitty after it was all said and done. But yeah, yeah the article is great. It's great, great. You should check that out. And uh, the next thing that we have is uh, a little update on the Throwback Network. Uh, if you get our shows oh, from yeah. Throwback Network, there was a little bit of a hiccup due to uh, the way that our feed was was outputting uh, the code. Um, I got in touch with Flack, and he fixed it almost immediately, uh, like a champ. So, and now our, our feed looks great on there. We've got all the show notes and everything, and all yeah. the links. And so, uh, if you were wondering where we went, there were some people that wrote in that wondered, uh, "We're back. We have not been kicked off the Throwback Network yet." <laughs> the Thrown um, Off Network, <laughs> yeah. starring us. <laughs> but uh, we're we're back and better than ever on there. Yep, yep. Um, oh, one last thing. It's actually this was late and early on, but I still have it here. Uh, I've heard about this game too. Have you heard about this thing? It's called Reshoot. It's an Amiga shoot 'em up that's being made. I have heard of that. Um, the, apparently, it's close to being released. Finally, mm-hmm. uh, it's a twelve hundred um, shoot 'em up. I've seen screenshots of it, and they're baffling. I have no idea what's yeah, happening. Yeah, it's these screenshots. The, the the enemy the enemies are not really sprites as much as they're polygonal kind of geometric shapes. Uh, it's different than the it's geometric. It's sort of shapes. like a res or something. That yeah, they're... maybe like something like that. It's not. It's definitely not like <laughs> Geometry Wars where they're flat. These are rotating geometric. It's sort of like uh, I don't. I don't even know what the. I don't know what it comes. It reminds me of. It's just really odd, goofy look. And I'm sure this is going to look different when it's in moving. Right well, now, I'm just. I, I have stuff. seen there. They he did post a video. The developer did post a video. Oh on, really? I haven't yeah. not seen a video. And for it. um, it it they they rotate. You know, it's kind of slowly rotating geometric shapes. I don't know if those are the final designs, but it's very graphically impressive. Really? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, anyway, reshoot. We're got to check that out when it comes out. We'll give it a we'll give it a look for sure. Obviously. Cool. Well, let's go ahead and start talking about our game of the week. All right. Banshee. So Banshee is a uh, <laughs> vertical. Top-down shooter released in 1994 by Core Design, and uh, on exclusively on the 1200 and the CD32. So if you've got an older Amiga, you're out of luck. But if you've got the 1200 or CD32, you can benefit from all that AGA goodness. Uh, Core Design is a British video game developer, uh, best known probably for Tomb Raider. I mean, let's be honest. It's funny. It's I had forgotten Core existed. I'm not going to lie. And so when I was doing research on Core, and they were like, oh, yeah, they did Tomb Raider. I was like, oh, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was baffled, you know. Uh, uh, and the original Tomb Raider, what a game, right? It was awesome. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they did. Did they just do the, did they just do the, uh, the uh, Sega um, Saturn version? Or did they do, they, did they didn't do the other ports, did they? Did, or did they do all of them? Did, this, did Tomb Raider come out on the Saturn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought yeah. it was a PlayStation 1 deal. No, no. Okay. I've got it. Okay. <laughs> but okay. I, I think it originally came out on the Saturn. Uh, I, don't hold me to that. Like I said, we're not a console <laughs> podcast. This is just some stuff I glean. I, but just dig it into them a little bit. It was funny. A couple, a bunch of their employees came from Gremlin. Really? I saw that, too, which I thought was interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gremlin did some good stuff. Um, they didn't last very long, either. It's funny. The, the outfit that made... Uh, 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 Tomb Raider, they basically, uh, they Ido, Idos, mm-hmm. is that Idos, right? Yeah. Um, basically got them. You know, this is back when a lot of companies were shifting, right? Um, and it was part of a distribution company called Centra Gold when Idos acquired them in '96, right? Uh, 
Ida sold most of everything of Centra Gold, but they kept U.S. Gold. So apparently they bought U.S. Gold. <laughs> they kept the quality. Right. And U.S. Gold, and US gold owned Core Design. How odd. Ponder that How for a odd. moment. And then uh, um, they did uh, they did Thunderhawk for the Mega CD. Do you remember that? No, I Which never is, played you know, Thunderhawk. Which is the, the uh, Genesis CD thing. Is, and it, is, is that... Uh, that isn't that isometric helicopter game, is it? I, I don't know. Okay. I don't remember that one. And then they did Tomb Raider. They did the original Tomb Raider for the Saturn, okay. according to Wiki. Uh, um, but they ended up, they're gone. Mm-hmm. You know, I think they, they ended up, uh, uh, they did 2003 uh, Tomb Raider Angel of Darkness, and uh, it didn't get over. And then... Uh, so they're some not their, involved. Some of the design team left, and then they're, they're, they're not involved in the current crop. No, of, of well, more not crop as games. not as core, right? You know, but they really, I, I was surprised by that. Yeah. you know, you don't think about that stuff much, but yeah, that's got to be disheartening, though. Yeah. You know, you took your, you got your baby here, and then you, you know, la vie. But well, they made a lot of money in the uh, in the in the intern, and yet still couldn't survive in yeah. an age where great I mean look at like a psychosis I mean these, all these companies mm-hmm. that did good work they just go away well know? a lot of times your best programmers and your best game designers aren't the best business per- people yeah I suppose you're right or they just get clipped and mm-hmm. move somewhere else yeah. you know it's crazy it's tragic yeah um, but uh, this game is set in sort of a uh, in sort of an alternate future uh, steampunk not unlike uh, the Chaos Engine. In fact, this game, these characters would have been right at home. It's like this is the aerial version. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with with Navi and the Preacher and all those guys. So um, this is, uh, you know, at first glance, it looks like a blatant 1942, 1941 ripoff. But there's a little thing. There are little things that that are different. Uh, of course, the things that are the same that every vertical shooter has. You know, you've got you know, quick rapid fire capabilities. You can hold the button down. Uh, you've got a loop to loop that is straight out of 1941. Yeah. Um, now, one thing that's different though is that you can actually. Aaron didn't know this, but I told him that you can use the loop to loop <laughs> to destroy your enemies. If you're if you've got a line of planes in front of you and you do the loop to loop as you come back around, you will mow into them and take no damage yourself. Yeah, it's got. I've never done that. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, that's that's one thing that's different. One, another one of the big things that's different between this game and 1942 and a lot of other vertical shooters is that there is some horizontal movement of the screen. Yes, yeah, so that that is good. I, I like I like shooters that give you a little bit of side scroll. Mm-hmm. So if you've got you know you've got opportunities for points in you know heavily populated areas, but you've also got opportunities for death because of all the bullets. So if you want to take it a little easy, you can. Uh, in a lot of places, uh, you start out. You're flying over the ocean. It's your typical, you know, other planes and things like that. But uh, when you start fighting the the bigger, uh, the gunships and things like that, there's a lot of little things that they did to animate uh, the guns. You know, you'll actually see missiles being loaded into the silos. You know, it'll pop up and you'll see the missiles appear. Yeah, I love that. Um, so there's a lot of little touches that are really nice. I like when you shoot a, uh, uh, something with guys in it. Some The guys sometimes will just get smashed. Or you know splatter, but sometimes they'll run around screaming and they'll be on fire, mm-hmm. which I always. Th- it's very. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. It kind of reminded me of both cannon fodder and also the one part of wings, you know, where you're in the uh, the, the isometric section of wings. Um, the stages themselves, uh, you know, they start out and it's very World War Two, but as you progress further and further, things get weird. Um, there's uh, you fly over a graveyard, uh, zombies come out. Uh, you can fly. You you go into space at one point. Yeah, that, that's toward the end. Um, so it's you know it's not just a there's bunch Arctic. of Arctic. Yeah, it's not just a bunch of all you know military types. I will say the, the first level. I think <laughs> it's not the best showcase for the game. It's as a, many of the games that we cover on this it's podcast. very brown. Mm-hmm. The first level is and some of the other levels too are very brown. Brown and gray. Yeah. This game is dull looking. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's got takes nothing away from the gameplay, but it just. And don't get me wrong, the graphics are sharp, they're attractive, they're well drawn, mm-hmm. but they're just dull looking. Uh, that they, they don't pop. There's no strong colors that make the screen pop. They just I mean, now maybe this was by design. I don't know if they were going for some kind of I don't know, but I you know, I got tired of looking at brown and gray. Mm-hmm. And it was just too much. Uh, the in fact this section where you fly over snow and stuff, I was like, Oh, anything. This is this is better <laughs> than nothing. 
the uh, I agree with you on the, the as usual the, the fine details of what make the game. The the when missile launchers rise up out of the uh, boats or submarines and and you know you can see the missiles start shooting. That's awesome. When they when you blow up part of them and, and another weapon will come up. You see the things coming up. You see planes launching. You see you see tanks and stuff getting position. Little things like that. And these guys must have really put in a lot of uh, effort because if you look at I, I played through most of the game with a cheat almost to the end and I know this game runs like 58 minutes or something like that. That's a lot of scrolling mm-hmm. if you think about it. And it's not like there's a lot of downtime with the cut, cut scenes or something. It's basically you beat a level it'll say okay now you're going here here's what you need to do you're off again. So it's just like a, you know just like 20 seconds or whatever so you're looking at 50 plus minutes of just scrolling terrain that's a ton now i'm not going to sit here and say it's all original and there's nothing repetitive but um each uh, scene feels different to a certain degree some scenes you're going over large bases which i like there's one where you fly into the city and you're just raising hell you know and you're going to get blow up this mansion that one's fun and, and there'll be people running around the streets. There's on the Arctic level. There's polar bears running around. So they they gave it a, the nice little touches it needed to uh, to be interesting. Uh, I just wish they'd added a little more color. And it's something else I'd mention. Uh, I don't think this got an, a uh, a U.S. release. No. And so uh, running this on my 1200 was proved to be difficult. Uh, it would run, but it was glitchy. And so I ended up having to play it on uh, emulated. Which I, I hate to do that when I've got the Amiga set in there, so I don't know if there's a fix or something I can get it to run. I guess I could run on CD32; it would, it would probably run okay on that. But uh, so that's kind of annoying. Uh, no background music during the actual uh, gameplay. This game would have been awesome with some music. Yeah, that probably would have pepped it up considerably. Some really good tunes, you know, uh, didn't happen. I'm assuming it was for, you know, resource sake, mm-hmm. you know. Something like the, that. The game itself controls very smoothly. Your plane moves exactly where you need it to go. Yeah. Uh, the power-ups are useful. You can tell what the power-ups are when they come to you. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, a neat thing that you don't see in a lot of games. Uh, in the two-player co-op mode, you have the option to make the power-ups color-coded, and you can only pick up your colors. So you've got a gray ship and a brown ship. Oh, gray and brown again. And uh, you, uh, the power-ups will come two at a time, so you, nobody ever gets screwed out of power-ups in theory, uh, but sometimes, you know, they'll drop closer to one player than the other, but you can only pick up your ship's color power, which is kind of cool. Yeah, we found that, at least I found that when me and Boat played this, I, I didn't. I, it's nice that that option's there, but I think I'd rather just have it free-for-all. Number one, because I'm a greedy bastard. Number two, I would always be... It seemed like every time I was hurt, I'd be near the wrong color, and it's hard <laughs> to tell. I will say something else with the colors being sort of washed out it, when you're playing that two-player version, me and Boat... Uh, kept getting confused as to which plane was which. That's very true. Now, now, that happens in a lot of games, but it seemed like in this one it was m- more pronounced yeah. because we were having a heck of a time. And, and I will say that the controls are sharp. The two-button uh, option is great. Um, the uh, the fact that uh, you know even with two players at the same time, it still runs smooth. This is the kind of game, if the controls hadn't been spot on, this isn't some kind of super frog type deal. If the controls aren't spot on this, it's not the game is ruined. Mm-hmm. So they must have really spent a lot of time tweaking the controls to make them work perfectly, and uh, they they did. Uh, they were quite good. What did you think of the uh, the bosses and whatnot? Is it- I thought the bosses were really. I mean, the I only faced two of them. Uh, the the first boss is two big planes. Um, it's it was okay. The second boss was much better. Uh, you have you got three. Um, Submarines. The first in the way, and you've got one that you face at first when you beat it. Two more appear on the sides, and they both fire. Their first phase is firing bullets at you. Then when you beat the first phase, they fire rockets. The animation again is very impressive. Um, I thought the the bosses were well done, um, but you know the, nothing nothing that really blew me away. Yeah, I, I got it further obviously. Cause of course, I cheated. There are cheats for this. They're to let you continue indefinitely, which, thank God, because I couldn't even get past the... Well, I'm trying to think where I got. I got to the submarines. I got past the submarines uh, before I had to use a continue. But it's it, this game is... If you're not a good Twitch-type gamer, I can see people eating this thing up. I can see why it's popular. Yeah. Because this is the kind of game... I was telling Boat earlier, 
if I get a, a, a circuit board uh, for my JAMA machine or uh, this came across to me on a Neo Geo, I wouldn't think twice. It would look just, it's it looks just like something you would expect to see on, on a, which is a compliment mm-hmm. because those game, those systems, the arcade obviously and the Neo Geo are known for the really good shooters. So this would fit right in. <clears throat> uh, there's no problems there. But, uh, um, you know, overall, I enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed the game. I wish they could have done a few things differently, you know, just small things, too. I mean, if the solid gameplay is there, just a little, the few little things, like maybe a little more color, the uh, the fact that uh, you didn't have any in-game music. Again, this is the kind of game that really could use it. I, I will say, I like the, the power-up system was unique. I think I've seen this a couple times where you shoot the power-ups to change them, but it's not something I would have seen a whole lot no, of. No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's been done before, but I can't recall another game just offhand that did it. And something else I like... Uh, is the is the fact that you can get greedy, and like for example, after you beat uh, the first bosses, uh, when you get a big power up, you can either have a, 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 a extra man or you can have big points. You know, and that's an awesome option mm-hmm. is to be able to go and get the points. Yeah, you know, anytime I'll, you're giving the player different options depending on their <clears> skill level, it's a good. Thing. I know because when I was playing this, I thought to myself, this is when I was trying to get a score to beat Boat, I thought, well. What's more important to me, an extra man or 5,000 points? Because 5,000 points aren't easy to get. No, no. You know, and so uh, it, it made you think. Um, the uh, the opening cr- cr- screens, the intro to this is pretty wacky. It's uh, basically <laughs> uh, the Conqueror comes down just because he wants to. I believe it's from the planet Styx or something like that. Right. And his name is was a Svorn Svengenson or something like that, which I thought the hero's name, I should say. <laughs> And, and uh, uh, the bad guy has the hero's father killed because he fails to invent the microwave. Yeah, and it's it's <clears> set <throat> in the future, but there's still black and white TV. Yeah, it's very tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. It's, very, it's very goofy, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, it was the uh, guy that coded this thing was a guy named, and I'm going to butcher this, uh, Soren Hannibal. And the Soren has an O with like a zero, so I don't know how they're... You, how you, you got me. Well, I don't know what it's called. Um the uh, uh, and basically this is what he worked on the uh, the uh, guy that did the graphics Jacob Anderson he worked on this and then <laughs> he also worked, the only two games he worked on were this and Cover Girl Strip Poker Ooh, so went a little blue for the second well I, you know the funny thing is this is the graphics this are really good yeah you know for the most part <laughs> so that I thought that was kind of funny um you know the the game uh, screams for a sequel. I'd love to see someone, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know what these guys are doing now, but, you know, hey, Amiga's coming back, guys. If you're listening, this would be a good one to make back up. It had sort of a, what do you equate this to? Is it more like a, I don't want to say Raiden. It's more of a, I don't know, like Alcon maybe or something. I mean, it was it was 1942-ish, but only really for the loop and some of the, you know, it didn't In really remember. setting, I mean, your plane is a World War II style. Right. Well, actually, when you go to space, it changes, too. Mm. It, you get a more of a spacey spaceship. Mm-hmm. So it's, it really kind of, you know, it looks sleeker. Mm-hmm. But it, it didn't really, it didn't play like 42 to no. me. Did it play like that for you? I mean, this no, it plays, it, I mean, it's much faster. Yeah. You know, your plane moves more smoothly. It's just a later release. That's yeah. That's what it comes down yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. But overall, you know, uh, if I had, if I'd had an Amiga uh, back then and, and, had access to it. It's four discs. Really? Yeah. Or, wow. or you know, or you can get the CD32 mm-hmm. version. So, four discs. That's. I mean, think about that for a shooter. I don't know. I guess you would swap. That might explain another little tidbit of uh, annoyance I had in this game. Is that the levels are so long. Mm-hmm. That may explain why they're so long. Maybe they're just. You know, maybe it's a disc swapping right thing. You mm-hmm. know, but if you think about how long these. I mean, you're talking. You're talking. What's it got? Four or five levels. I think it's got. I think it's got four, doesn't it? And each, so you're talking about levels that are like 15 minutes long. Boy. And that's a... <laughs> that's a long time to be sitting there shooting. And that's a lot, that's a lot not just that, but it's a lot of uh, stuff to put on a disc. Mm-hmm. You know, so I thought that was interesting that, that only had four only had four discs. Um, <clears throat> I looked this thing up on eBay as I'm off to do, and it's there. It was uh, not real hard to find. The Amiga CD32 version apparently is rare. Um, I saw, I saw it, one a copy of it go for a hundred pounds. Mm. Um, that's pretty high dollar. Yeah, a lot of games we look at. But most, I saw a lot of other, ver- you know, the regular version boxed, forty pounds, you know, in that area. Still, you know, it ain't cheap. But I mean, it's there. So if you're looking to get yourself a copy, it's there. 
Uh, did you look into how this were viewed? Uh, you know, I didn't. I've got I've got some numbers here. I had a look. Uh, believe it or not, folks, this reviewed well. <laughs> <laughs> You'd think so, since it's actually pretty awesome. Um, and plus, since this was coming out in 94, you know, people were eager to give the Amiga any good press, especially people that were writing for Amiga magazines. Yeah. Um, most of, most uh, reviews had it in the 80s and 90s. I don't think I saw a single review under under 80. So it was pretty well received. Yeah, and I mean, that's that's fair. Sure, sure. And, uh, um, it, you know, overall, I liked it. Mm-hmm. There were things... They could have been better. I don't want to sound like I'm, I know I've pointed out a bunch of flaws, but I mean, all the flaws are so so ridiculously small if you consider the overall package. Yeah, yeah. I you know. I sat and I threw it on a podcast and I played a bunch of this, and it was just a fun game to kind of zone out to. Yeah, I'll um, go, I'll go back to it, and it and you're right. It's just a fun shooter. Shooters aren't really my bag, uh, but uh, it, it, I didn't feel like I had much of a chance to get too far, but I did get better. Mm-hmm. So. I know I've read people that are getting a level four on the one one without hitting to continue. I would love to be those people. I just I don't know if I don't have the technique or, yeah, <laughs> or the I patience. Know. I don't know I don't what know. it would be, but thumbs up to them. What did you get? What was your score? Oh, my score. Uh, fourteen thousand two hundred seventy-eight. <laughs> did you crush me? Fifteen thousand eight hundred thirty-one. Oh, no. <laughs> oh no! So close. Dead gummit. All right, Aaron. Next week. Yes, I know we've we, we've all been waiting for this. <laughs> yeah. Our long-awaited conclusion to our trilogy of pinball games on the Amiga. A trilogy. So, if you recall, our first episode was the illustrious first-person pinball, hideous, <laughs> and uh, pinball dreams. Much better. And then we did pinball fantasies mm-hmm. for our second episode, yeah. and we're gonna wrap things up. With Pinball Illusions and Slam Tilt Pinball. The double. So if you're a fan of pinball on the Amiga, uh, make sure you check out our next episode. Yeah, sorry it took so long, but... Uh... <laughs> we got, there's a bunch of games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're going to do that. We'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, Chris Fold, Zach Zimmerman, Adam Bradley, Will Williams, Daniel Bingston, O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Brent Dowdy, and Chad Halstead. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. list gets bigger every time, it seems like. Uh, if you uh, want to become an Amigos uh Patreon, patron, patron. <laughs> you can check out our page on Patreon, or uh, we also just take PayPal donations. So if you want to send us a few bucks on there, that's fine too. Hey, whatever. Yeah. Um. So until next time, adios. adios.